Hello and welcome to another segment of interviews that matter. I'm your host Raj Mehta. Friends, in this segment we bring those guests who influence our lives. This includes elected officials, policy makers, heads of major organizations and other dignitaries. It is my sincere hope that the knowledge brought in by this guest will help our community. Today we have such guest Kevin Arbot. Kevin is a producer and director in Hollywood. He makes independent films and has a lot of knowledge about the in- entertainment industry. Let's meet Kevin. Kevin, Hi. welcome, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming today, taking time. You're Appreciate welcome. it. So you are a director and you are a producer of a Bollywood, Hollywood, sorry, <laughs> Hollywood, Hollywood movies, Hollywood yeah. movies and Hollywood and uh, TV shows rather. So let's hear from you. What is what is your background? What you know? How did you come up to this level? I started very, very, very young. Okay. Very, very young. And what was happening was I was 19 years old, mm-hmm. and I believe at the time I was working at. I thought you were 19 now. <laughs> well, now I do. Yeah. You know, the funny thing is, when I was younger, I used to lie about my age to make myself older, and now you know I'm going to eventually have to start lying to make myself younger. But uh, you know, I had a bit of you know street smarts within me. And I applied for a job. They were looking for a like a model booker, you know. Okay. And a model booker is someone who, you know, the models come in and you call different clients, like you know, Riceroni. We need you know a, a nice face for Riceroni. Right. And all of a sudden, I became a model agent at 19. So I actually had to lie and say I was 23 because <laughs> I was just so young. It was it was absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. So I started then, and then I learned to eventually hate the modeling business completely. Mm-hmm. And that's when I kind of transition, transitioned into being an actor's agent. And um, that's when I represented a lot of kind of, you know, bigger name people, and uh, like Lauren Velez, who was on Dexter, and mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Wes Bentley of American Beauty. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, I transitioned to producing and uh, mm-hmm. directing, um, which I think nowadays is kind of a natural progression. There's, there's not many people in this business that stay within one category. Uh, I think most people kind of branch out into mm-hmm. producing and directing and sometimes even acting. You know, you'd be surprised mm-hmm. how uh, you know one person as a producer and then all of a sudden you see them in the movie and you're like, what are they doing? And mm-hmm. Because there's no, there's no boundaries anymore and then mm-hmm. you can do all. Right, right. Yeah. So you, you said you became an agent. Yes. Right? I mean, to becoming an agent, you have to know somebody. Uh, How do you become agent? Kind of. You have to know, not that you have to know somebody, you have to know the business. Okay. You have to know the business. Okay. And that is what separates most people who have some sort of longevity in their business who can get in versus the people who can't, is, uh, is the information. Right. So one of the things I would do when I was very, very young, I used to kind of read the trades. Okay. And, you know, and there'd be stories every single day about who just got hired one place, who just got fired one place. And what got me into this is a ridiculous story I've never really told. Good, uh, good. What got I like me, it. <laughs> <laughs> what really truthfully got me in their door was mm-hmm. at New Line Cinema, mm-hmm. there was kind of a really popular producer that did all these great movies named Mike DeLuca. Uh-huh. And I read one day that he got fired uh-huh. and that he, uh, w- you know, eventually probably the next day or someone would replace him. But I knew like once, when you hear about these things, they already have a replacement of mine or the replacement's right. already there. So what I did was mm-hmm. I called New Line Cinema and I said, hey, this is Kevin Arbor here. You know, I used to work with Mike all the time. I feel like my project might, you know, fall by the wayside. Who, who should I talk to now? I'm like, oh, okay, talk to Kale. And, uh, and his name was Kale Boyder. So already they just had assumed that I had a project with the studio uh. because I pretended to know the guy who they just fired. And, you know, when someone is fired, there's usually just a little bit of a shakeup and, you know, there's a misinformation here and there. So right. they just assumed that I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> and they put me through to the new head guy. And I was like, hey, Kale, hey. So, you know, I used to work with Mike, and you probably already know the project I was working on, and I'm guessing it's going to be dead. We should talk about something new. Let's talk about a new project. It's like, all right, let's talk about a new project. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and that's how it started. That is literally how it started, and it got me through the door. And from there, you know, and then because the, I came off, he would call people and say, hey, you know, this guy, Kevin, you know, he used to work with Mike. You know, Mike, you know, of course, everyone knows Mike, of course. Like, so he's got stuff around. You should really talk to him. And that, from there, I got to talk to Paramount and DreamWorks and... Yeah, so what got me in the door was, was a lot of uh, BS but knowledge of what's going on. 
Very nice. Very good to know. Very good to know. It's interesting. It's yeah, but that, I will say in my defense, that was uh, 16 years ago. So <laughs> you don't, don't call the police on me. Well, at least it started that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, but now you're past that anyway. Now I'm past, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. So you were you were born in Hempstead? I was. Long Island? I was born in right. Long Island, Hempstead, yeah. Right. And uh, your uh, what is your background like? You know, where, where did you go to school? Um, I first, I, high school was Kallenberg Memorial High School, okay. and I went there all the way up until the middle of 11th grade, right. and I just got very disenchanted with the Catholic high school system, when I was like, I begged my parents, I want to get out of here, I want to get out of here, mm -hmm. it's like, I want to go to public school, I want to go to public school, right. and he said, finally, okay, you can go to Uniondale High School. And I went to Uniondale High School. It was like the biggest mistake of my entire mm -hmm. life. It was just, I mean, it literally went from one extreme to mm -hmm. the next. It went from, you know, mm -hmm. super rigid to the point where, you know, the mm -hmm. teachers mm -hmm. were afraid to say anything to the students, you know. Right. Um, but right. that's where my, I went for schooling. And mm -hmm. regarding college, mm -hmm. um, it, it was pretty much at that point after like maybe mm -hmm. one semester of uh of college, I realized this is not for me. I'm not learning anything for where I wanted to. Because at that point, I, I really did know what I wanted to do. Uh -huh. um, right. Uh, and I just this is I, I don't I don't want to waste time. Right. Right. And even at a very young age, I've always been a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. Always been, and, and I feel like <coughs> most people who again have some sort of longevity in any business mm -hmm. who are successful are pragmatists, and you just have to think mm -hmm. in the most logical way possible. Mm -hmm. And I said, I, I don't want to spend four years of mm -hmm. time that I could be doing something else trying to make someone else happy mm -hmm. when I know what mm -hmm. I'm good at and I know what I should mm -hmm. be doing. Interesting. So Very I nice. left and that's when I started pursuing entertainment. Wow. So, I mean, you said the knowledge, right? That you had the knowledge, you were reading about entertainment. So yeah. From the beginning, you know what you want to do, yeah. what you wanted to do rather. Yeah. That you wanted to go into ent entertainment from the beginning, right? You made up your mind, and that's how you pursued it f Absolutely. further. Yeah. Right. So, uh, do you have any kind of like, for example, any uh, history of your brother, sister being in the ent entertainment industry? I mean, how did you get how did you get motivated into entertainment? Well, uh, my brother actually did go to film school, and that's a whole other subject. I feel like film schools, with the exception of like NYU and Columbia mm -hmm. and like USC, mm -hmm. are they're mm -hmm. kind of a waste. And he didn't go to the three I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, but he did go to film school. But from a very young age, it was kind of a uh, a family that, and I think most families, mm -hmm. you know, in the 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. just grew up on movies, you know. There's, and I remember my first memory of a movie mm -hmm. was being in a theater for Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I was oh, five years wow. old. And okay. uh, I just remember watching this this thing, and I just couldn't believe, like, this is so amazing. And, the, you know, this guy, and he's doing this, and I just fell in love with that. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to do that. I was like, that is something. The age of five. But it, but it wasn't, you know, it was something I had thought of, but not seriously that young. Of course. Um, but, you know, as I started to get older and older, and I just kind of weighed the reality. Like, well, could I do it? Like, what, what does this person have? And, you know, the business is broken wide open now. It's very different from when I was much younger. But, you know, in the 90s, I think there was that mm -hmm. misconception that, Everyone in the business knew each other, and they were all related to each other. Right. So if somebody was as a director, you just assumed, well, his father had to be a director, or his grandfather a director, and you had to be born into it. Like it was, that's you know, right. like royalty. That's right. That's like right. if you want to be yep. the king, you have to yep. be born into right. it. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then as I got older, I realized that's completely not true. You know, you just you you kind of work for it. You ah, work for it. Interesting. Yeah. See, that is why I'm saying in Bollywood, you know. And normally, all the uh, you know, like people who are kids, 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 they are the one who become actors and actresses, and they come become directors and all that. Like what you said, you know, yeah. it's an ancestry business rather. You yes. know, in in Bollywood, right? Uh, of course, you know there are a lot of newcomers come in, but it's not that easy for them. Yeah, you know, but here it's not true. You say, no, no, here here it's. It's, it's different, you know, here is, you know, you really just have to make your mark, you have to kind of stand out from the rest. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. once you are somewhat noticed, if you can kind of hold on to that mm -hmm. and, you know, stretch it into a career, then, mm -hmm. then you have mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Would you consider yourself lucky that you got this break from, uh, you know? I think, any, I think in the entertainment business, luck will always play a part of it. Mm -hmm. will always play a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't create an opportunity, mm -hmm. then you're not going to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, I, I mean, there. Are, I can really call out so many times that, you know, if I had made a right instead of a left, I wouldn't be where I was. And so obviously uh, there is that. But I think that's kind of life in general. You know right. what I mean? If you've, if you've ever 
you know, stepped mm -hmm. off of a curb mm -hmm. at the wrong mm -hmm. time and you realize you must have been hit by a truck, you know, that you were mm -hmm. lucky at that moment, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that does have mm -hmm. something to do with it. But I think it mostly has to do, again, mm -hmm. with knowledge. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about, you know, beforehand about the statistics of the business of people who can make a living and who right. can't. And right. as of right. now, it's probably 2% that can make a living and it might even be less. And there's a reason for that. And the reason is that this is the only business in the world where you can declare yourself something simply by proclamation. For instance, if you want to be a doctor, you can't just say, I'm a doctor. Someone hand me a scalpel mm -hmm. and start cutting people open. There's no way. You have right. to go to, you know, four years of college and three years of medical school. You know, you have to work at it. Right. Whereas, right. you right. know, this isn't um, the same exact thing where you can, uh, you, people just say, I'm an actor. And they try to pursue acting. Whether they have talent or not, and usually they don't, it's just kind of mm -hmm. the way it is. Mm -hmm. And they haven't prepared, they haven't worked at it. So you'll have someone declaring himself an actor, mm -hmm. you know, who is not someone who should be an actor. And that's why that 98% of people aren't really doing anything, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And they also know nothing about the business. And I, it, as an agent, it used to drive me nuts. And I would say, okay, do you know all the casting directors in New York? Like who they are? Like no, I had no clue. I'm like that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I'm like you know we're not even talking about L.A. where there's probably 200 working cast directors. In New York, at any given time, there's probably only maybe at the most seven or eight television shows that are you know considered that they're ongoing, and maybe about 20 independent films that year. It's very simple to know who all the casting directors are. You should be able to rattle them off like, you know, mm -hmm. the seven dwarves. Mm -hmm. And uh, when people don't know who they are, I'm like, well, you haven't done your homework. You don't, you, you don't, you don't get it. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you don't know what you're talking about, then you cannot create that opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you don't have to go as far as, you know, pretending you know the ousted studio head of New Line Cinema, but at the mm -hmm. very least, you should be able to, mm -hmm. you know, know who's casting Law and Order and go, God, if I can just, you know, get in front of, mm -hmm. you know, Jonathan Strauss that I know that I can mm -hmm. maybe get a little mm -hmm. part on that show. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's not easy to meet these people. Well, nothing's easy. If, oh, it's, right. if, it, if it's anything worth right. anything isn't easy, I mean, otherwise everyone would do it. <laughs> um, but that's great because that, that you, you don't, there's no feeling of satisf satisfaction right. if you don't work for it. Exactly. No, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I worked very hard for what I'm doing, business. In Absolutely. Company. Yep, yep. So two percent people get successful only. Or I wouldn't say successful, successful, I would say work. We're going to make a living. Oh, who can make a living out yeah. of entertainment business. Yeah. And, and those people are really like a dedicated, really, you know, I mean, they're knowledgeable. Uh, this is what I'm, I'm, am I describing it correctly? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you have a passion, passion for it, right? Like, Absolutely. you know, you had a passion since you were five. Yeah. And that's how you kind of grew into this. Yeah, and, and you have to fly, you know, again, and depending on how you, but Log Long Island in particular is right. not known, for the exception of the, the people who like the Jerry Seinfeld and the Alec Baldwin and the Rosie O'Donnells who happen to be born in Long Island, it's not known as a place where that, that fosters the idea of getting into the entertainment industry. It's right. just, just, it's not even mm -hmm. like New York mm -hmm. City where mm -hmm. it's a little more feasible. So when you tell your parents, I'm going to do this, to look at you like, what are you, out of your mind? <laughs> I mean, and even when I right. come back, you know, um, from anywhere, a trip, and I happen just to be out somewhere, and somebody asks me, what do you do? And I say what I do, I might as well say I'm an astronaut. I mean, that's kind of how <laughs> far out uh, <laughs> the idea of saying that I'm a, you know, writer, director, producer is. It's just not thought of. But mm -hmm. if it's something that, you know, and this is, I don't want to sound too, you know, mm -hmm you know, literary and flighty, but if it's something that you literally can't live without, mm -hmm. that if it's within you, you have to go for it. You have to go for it. Mm -hmm. Because even if you quote unquote fail, you went for it. Yes. And exactly. I always say you, you exactly. only regret the things you don't do. Right, right. You know, like, and, and you have to know. Yeah. You have to know. I, I, I agree with you. And we, we had an Indian movie called Three Idiots. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a similar theme that, you know, you, you become what you want to become. Yeah. You know, like in, in parents may say or, or other people may say, you are only this is successful, so you become that. Yeah. It doesn't happen that way. Exactly. Yeah, that was the whole theme of the movie, actually. So how many movies have you directed now? I mean, you have so, so many movies, actually. Well, it's, it's not that, uh, yeah. see, I've been involved in many, many movies, but I'm actually on my, technically my, well, I directed an experimental movie right after I left. A, I left a big company called Lee Daniels Entertainment, and they're the company that did like mm -hmm. Monsters Ball. Right. Currently, you know, The Butler mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, Precious. Mm -hmm. And right after I left there, I directed a movie called Serial, 
Okay. And I co-directed it with uh, actually another Long Islander, uh, Larry Strong. It was very experimental. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it wasn't something that I could mm -hmm. honestly say was uh, representative of what I want to put out there, or, you know, who I am. And I, I think you'll find that with most, mm -hmm. you know, directors who, you know, mm -hmm. kind of the first thing, it's like, oh, geez, you know, I wouldn't want you to see that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, that was my first movie. And then I... I kind of co-directed and second unit directed a kind of a big documentary that's out right now called Generation Iron. Okay. Um, you know, that's about bodybuilding and Mr. Olympia, which is actually kind of a dream for me because one of my favorite um, uh, documentaries of all time is Pumping Iron with Arnold Schwarzenegger. And actually, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a huge inspiration to me. Uh, that, that's, um, mm -hmm. I, I feel like what Arnold Schwarzenegger has accomplished in his life for someone who was not even born in this country. Right is insane, is insane. And, and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. to find someone who has achieved so much coming from mm -hmm. so little, you'd be hard pressed. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And now I just directed a movie called uh, Police State, which mm -hmm. we're now in something called post-production, where mm -hmm. you know the, the footage is being edited and you have your mm -hmm. test screenings. And test screenings are a very important part of the process, especially for a movie like that, because it's, mm -hmm. it's an adventure movie, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. kind of a, an unusual movie to make mm -hmm. at uh, a certain budget level, mm -hmm. and um, even the same adventure movie as a genre, most people immediately won't know the difference, uh, and I'll tell you the difference is mm -hmm. Die Hard mm -hmm. is an action movie. That's an action right. movie, which right. is great. Yeah. Raiders of the Lost Ark is an adventure movie. Mm -hmm. You know, and then with an adventure movie, it's a little bit lighter. You know, the it's not action se sequences. There are set pieces, like larger se set pieces that move the story along and inform on character mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. generally they're just a lot funner mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and that's the movie that's what police aid is it, it turned into an adventure movie but done in you know it, it's a contemporary adventure movie and it all takes place in new york city and obviously we didn't have a hundred million dollars to do it mm -hmm. so it, that was um in a way kind of an experiment in itself like could this be done mm -hmm. and i think we did it and you know even side by side i think we have more quote unquote set pieces and even like the Bourne Ultimatum. We have like pretty large set pieces mm -hmm. that we were able to accomplish. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the movie that I'm doing now that mm -hmm. I, I the hopefully, state. yeah, Police State that mm -hmm. kind of gets people talking for what it is. Well, we will talk about that after the break. We'll yeah. take a short break and we'll be right back. Please stay with us. Welcome back to Interviews That Matter. I'm your host, Raj Mehta. We are having a conversation with director, producer, Kevin Arbot. Kevin, welcome back, sir. So let's, let's you are a script writer. I also, right? yes, you I also write. write a script. Yeah. So how do you get inspired to write a particular script? Inspiration, I don't think there's one particular answer for, I think writers will always have different answers. Um, it just really depends on the project, and it's all, the answer is always going to be different, really. Mm -hmm. um, with Police State, it mm -hmm. really came out of, mm -hmm. I was at a point in my career where I wanted to do mm -hmm. something that was very commercial. You know, one of, the, one of the big things about doing independent movies in New York, mm -hmm. specifically mm -hmm. New York, okay. is that it's, it's New York, more than anything, is kind of a theater town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Meaning that, so when you want to do some type of film, it's always going to lean mm -hmm. towards something dramatic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, people are going to say, oh, you know, like, they're going to want you to do more movies like, you know, Winter's Bone and, you know, something that is dark rather than something that is light. Mm -hmm. And I specifically mm -hmm. said, you know, I really want to do something, you know, mm -hmm. lighter than that. And I wasn't sure what to do. Mm -hmm. And I had produced uh, kind of a big exhibit for the uh, Lincoln Center. Okay. Uh, in the city. And it was an amazing project that using these, like, uh, like these moving portraits, you know, we shot it with the, the phantom camera with it at a thousand frames per second. And it was like a portrait, but it was moving because, oh. you know, it was, it really was moving, you know, it was a great. And one of the guys in there was in a movie, uh, started a movie called Another Earth. Okay. And it was a very small, very, very small indie movie, but with a pretty high concept commercial premise. And, and that premise was that all of a sudden there was this second earth where everyone on that other earth were doubles of you, and it was just a such an interesting premise. Wow. Um, yeah, but a, a, and for an independent film, I, I don't think people usually do that. Right. And I said, I kind of want to do something like that. 
but I kind of thought and thought like, well, what can I do? And you know, when I when I write something, I don't. I, I usually write it for something that is doable. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I do write things that maybe you know, uh, yeah, you would need thirty, forty million dollars to do. But I wanted to do something that I could physically do in New York. So I came up with this idea of police state, uh -huh. and. Um, from there, I just started writing, and once I kind of get in my groove, it usually takes me about a month to get a really a good first draft out there, and then I kind of you usually send out that draft to people that you trust, and you get notes, and mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. the biggest thing with the screenplay mm -hmm. is that it's something that should be constantly changing, and then even when you're ready to shoot, mm -hmm. it's going to change some more. Mm -hmm. And what I mean is, mm -hmm. if you want to get mm -hmm. a really good movie, right. a really great movie. Right. It shouldn't be about getting that exact movie in your head or the exact movie you wrote. Mm -hmm. Because that means that the movie can only be as good as you imagine. Right. Right? Right. right. So when you're at casting, right. you know, the actors that are playing specific roles, because I have every role in my head, right? I have, right. you know, I have the whole world, really, because I, I wrote the whole world. But now there's an actor coming in who's really focusing on that one character. And obviously, if you're focusing on one character, you're probably going to think about it a little bit more in depth than even I did. Right. So. That actor, if they're really good, are going to come with mm -hmm. things that I hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. what I want. I want whoever is working on it, whether it be the director of photography, mm -hmm. the actors, and eventually it will be the editor, mm -hmm. to come in with something that I hadn't thought of. That mm -hmm. is what's going to make it a great movie. Okay. The collaboration. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm not as concerned about getting the exact movie for what I want. Right. I, I want to get the movie that's going to be the best. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as long as it doesn't change what my intention is, because that that mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that can happen, you know, mm -hmm. when you're writing a, a, a screenplay, right, and you do get notes, you're going to really get ultimately three types of notes. Okay, you're going to get the notes that make your script better; mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. are the best. Mm -hmm. There, you're going to get notes that make your script worse, mm -hmm. which aren't too troublesome because for the most part you can ignore them. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get notes that will change your script, and those are the most dangerous because. Mm -hmm. Those notes aren't necessarily bad or good, but it's just not exactly what you want to do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And it just mm -hmm. changes what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones where you have to be careful and kind of push back on mm -hmm. and go, well, I don't think I want to do this. I specifically mm -hmm. want mm -hmm. to tell this type of story in this type mm -hmm. of way. Because mm -hmm. police story could have, uh, excuse me, police state could have very easily have been mm -hmm. a really serious thriller. Mm -hmm. It could have very easily been you know, a really hard action movie, mm -hmm. you know, and it very easily could have been a drama. Mm -hmm. Very easily, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Um, and in actuality, you know, it was difficult mm -hmm. in the uh, pre-production phase really trying to explain to everyone that I'm doing it as an adventure movie. Mm -hmm. And because people haven't, you know, it, r adventure movies are pretty uh, far and few between, mm -hmm. and really. Mm -hmm. And in New York, completely unheard of. Mm -hmm. So. What I said I wanted to do it that way, it was just like, God, that's really weird. I'm like, even my, my lead, who was great, who really had to trust me on this, I and mean, he really had to take a leap of faith. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know you feel like, mm -hmm. you, at this point, you want to be like John McClane and Die Hard mm -hmm. in this scene. But I'm telling you, in this scene, you're really more Marty McFly from Back to the Future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was really. And once he kind of got that after the first or the second day, mm -hmm. it, what he... I mean, because there's a lot of trust. I mean, mm -hmm. to, if you think of Back to the Future and all mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. out there things, when you're making a film, you don't see the finished product, so you just have to completely trust the director. Right, right. And he right, completely right, trusted right. me about you know what I wanted right. to do, right. and he did it and and delivered, and it mm -hmm. was absolutely amazing. Yeah. So really, director is the one who really makes kind of movie, basically. Movie meaning I'm I'm talking about you know like the, the we had a we had a you know Bollywood actor here, a Bollywood yeah. actor director, right? Uh, Javed Jaffrey, mm -hmm. and he said it depends upon you know how my director wants me to say something, right. how deliver it, how right. how how does he want me to deliver? I mean, I can you know go in a soft level. If it is a gun scene, I can just go in and coolly shoot somebody. Yes, or I can sh you know go like a big macho man and shoot it that way. So mm -hmm. It's my director who decides really. Absolutely, you know, and I feel like you know directing. There are some, ba and I'll say, I'll just say bad directors right. who will, and it's something called line readings. We'll, we'll just say, I want you to say it like this. Mm. And that's bad. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. as a director, mm -hmm. the most I mm -hmm. can tell you is, mm -hmm. I know what's wrong. Okay. Like, w when, I, when we first do, when we, my first right. take right. is, I want to see what you're prepared. I'm not right. going to give, I mean, before we start rolling, why am I giving direction? I don't even know what they're going to do. Right. So, the first take, they do their thing. 
Right. Okay. Okay. And sometimes that's perfect. I'm like, I don't have to tell you anything. This is exactly what I want. Let's move on. Uh, or it's, you know, I, uh, mm -hmm. let's try to change the intention of that scene. I'm not going to tell them exactly how to do it, but let's just try to change it. Mm -hmm. And I'll know what's completely wrong. Mm -hmm. But sometimes they'll do it and it's different. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, you know what, even though it's different, I think that works. Mm -hmm. And I think that's better. Let's mm -hmm. do it that way. Okay. So you really, you really, truly cannot have an ego when you are directing because you will completely destroy your film. You will mm -hmm. get mm -hmm. in the way mm -hmm. of any progress mm -hmm. or, or, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, collaboration or growth Mm -hmm. that the film mm -hmm. will have mm -hmm. if you have a large ego because mm -hmm. uh, if you have a large ego it's my way or the highway right then that then obviously you are you don't progress no and then you you right. you're just getting in your own way because mm -hmm. no one's a genius here so when you write a script you have set a goal yeah right and then you give it to people who you trust I mean there are uh, professionals who look at your scripts and and who can make a comments things like that Maybe are they friends. professionals or friends yeah there, there are friends that are in the business in who the business. kind of understand story because it's not something you can't give it to mm -hmm. that's the thing you can't give your screenplay right. to you know your girlfriend mm -hmm. your boyfriend or, or your parents because right. they're you know mm -hmm. they can't divorce themselves with the fact that you're the ones who wrote it and mm -hmm. they're more than likely going to say they love it you know mm -hmm. And sometimes they will love it just because you wrote it, you know. Mm -hmm. You really have to give it to friends mm -hmm. who don't have any um, stake in mm -hmm. that project mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If they give it to someone who's good, who knows nothing about it mm -hmm. and they get a, a true, honest opinion about what it is. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. reason why you want to give it to multiple mm -hmm. people is because sometimes mm -hmm. uh, a particular subject is, is just not their thing. You mm -hmm. know what right. I mean? Like, right. yeah, I, I get scripts from friends where it's like, you know, I really wouldn't watch this type of movie, mm -hmm. but I think it's good. Mm -hmm. You know, or, or I, I mm -hmm. think it needs this work, and we'll give each other notes. Mm -hmm. And you know, you take the good notes, and you just mm -hmm. ignore the bad ones. But you should try mm -hmm. to give it to as many people as you can. Well, ultimately, you decide whether what is good and what is bad. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know? And sometimes you're right, and sometimes you're wrong. Exactly. Sometimes you're That's like, what I'm saying. God, I should listen to that guy. You know, <laughs> this, you is, go. this is horrible. What I just did. Yeah. This is terrible. Now you know, I, I've I've heard that there is a contest of uh, not contest. I would say. The you know idea comes from anywhere, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, all the common people or whoever is watching or any, anybody can give you an idea of a movie. Yeah, high level idea rather. Mm -hmm. And there is a contest that one of my friend went to in Chicago. That all you do is you know write a, a your idea, and 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 it's a contest that you know a lot of people write these ideas and and they win something, and then that concept obviously becomes the property of those people mm -hmm. is that something have you heard of something like that or there's a lot of or something like that? i would never do that and there's there's a lot of um kind of like pitch festivals and um those type mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. um i would never do it because mm -hmm. really I, I can only speak generally mm -hmm. nothing really good kind of comes from that okay you know okay mm -hmm. i think you know the mm -hmm. the best way mm -hmm. to do really do anything mm -hmm. is if you really want to make a movie Mm -hmm. You have to just write that script. You have to get it out there, and you have to keep writing, keep writing, and keep writing, and wow. keep writing. That's the only thing. There's no shortcut around. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just gonna. You're gonna write this one thing once. It's gonna be a first draft. You're gonna send it out, and people are gonna read it and go, "I love it," and they're gonna make it. Maybe that's happened once or twice in the mm -hmm. history of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but maybe a pig has flown in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But you don't see it very often. Right. So, uh, so really, there's no, there is no, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, nothing better than just writing, writing, and rewriting, and writing, and writing, and writing. So you have to be a really good writer. Eventually, uh, yeah. Right. I, I mean, I, you know, there are directors who don't write. You know, right. uh, uh, but I feel like a director who writes kind of has a leg up on anyone else because they understand mm -hmm. story better than mm -hmm. anyone. Mm -hmm. So let's go from script. Next step. Okay. What is the next step, and what is the next step, and the next step? Well, the next step of that is if you're, you're kind of, you decided you're going to make an independent film, right? You have to get money. Okay. First, what is independent film? Independent film is 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 a film that does not have the backing of a Hollywood studio. Okay. So you're trying to make a film, and Paramount Studios has nothing to do with it, uh, in the hopes of selling it to a bigger entity. So that, okay. that's really what independent film is. Okay. And that definition can range because there, there there are actually independent films right. that are made for like seven or even ten million dollars with mm -hmm. kind of name big stars, but in mm -hmm. actuality they are independent films. They they, they have no mm -hmm. um, you know studio backing mm -hmm. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. independently financed. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. So that's really what an independent film is, and, and, mm -hmm. and there are different levels. And for the most part, you're, you're, if you're trying to do this movie, it's, it's going to be kind of on that smaller level. Mm -hmm. So I think like the best thing to do is mm -hmm. you need to find someone 
mm -hmm. who has some sort of track record for doing something. Mm -hmm. The biggest mistake mm -hmm. I, I see all the time, mm -hmm. all the time, is mm -hmm. we want to do an independent film, and the cast, the crew, everybody involved mm -hmm. is your friends. That mm -hmm. is terrible. Mm -hmm. That is a terrible, terrible thing to do. Wow. Yeah, because you know if you're doing if you're doing an indie film. There could only be one inexperienced person on that set, and that is you. Hmm. You are the only one who's allowed to be completely inexperienced. The hmm. only one. Everyone else hmm. has to be experienced, hmm. especially if you have a very limited budget. Okay. Because if you're trying to use your friends, mm -hmm. you're gonna, there are going to be so many mistakes, and you'll eventually have to try and raise more money to fix those mistakes, mm -hmm. rather than if you just spent, you know, if you were trying to get, uh, you know, a line producer, right. and you know that a really good one is $250 per day, mm -hmm. and you know that your friend will do it $100 per day, and you're like, well, geez, I could save $150 per day when right. I go with my friend. Right, right. But with all the mistakes they made and all the things that they didn't, you know, he, he probably doesn't even know the tax laws in New York, he doesn't know <laughs> that you can get money back. Right, right. You right. would have saved right. a lot more money if you went with yeah. the guy for $250 per day. Right, right. You know, that, that is the most biggest mistake that most people mm -hmm. make. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing is, you mm -hmm. know, when you are, are making these films, you have mm -hmm. to think about, well, how does this investor get their money back? Mm -hmm. And that's very, very important. Right. Very, very important. Right. right. You know, you have to understand that even if, you know, in, in uh, you know, um, comparison to big films, right. if you're doing a movie for $100,000, that sounds like nothing. Like, if you, if you tell, you know, a studio, well, I made this movie right. for $100,000, they're going right. to be like, oh, my God, it's like, you know, right. the money for a lunch in one day for the right. studio. It's nothing. Right, right. But in reality, if you are borrowing this money, $100,000, if you think about it, it's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you have a responsibility to make sure that person not only gets that $100,000 back, but makes some sort of profit. Right. You know? Right. right. So you have to have someone involved that understands the distribution process, mm -hmm. that, that gets it, that has been through it before, mm -hmm. knows, you know, mm -hmm. how that works, and knows how, mm -hmm. if it's a type of film that works better going straight to festivals, is a type of film that works better mm -hmm. trying to get to, to some sort of video on demand deal is up a film mm -hmm. and you know a person who's done it knows that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that is the, but, but that but after you write that script that the next step really is finding someone who can invest in some money and to do that you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you can't be just one thing. So if you are the screenwriter, you can't just be the screenwriter and go, well, I hope this gets made. You really have to do research again on how um, tax laws work and you know what are the um, I, you know, incentives for any type of investor. Mm -hmm. And when done right, the, really the risk for an investor should go very, very, very low. Right. You know, right. ho hopefully in the right. 30 or the 40%. Right. Meaning if you're doing a film in New York City, New York right. is great right. because they have tax incentives. Right, right. And right. if you're doing it right, you can get upwards of around 35%. So you know automatically your film will get 35% back. So you're okay, so let, let's, let's just use the example of $100,000. Right, yeah. And you go, okay, 35% back, whew, okay. So I know that now at this point I need to, there's 65 grand that I need to make back. Well, federal law, and think, you know, Obama was great, he um, continued something called Section 181. Okay. And that is a law where you can, um, the investor can write off a large part of their investments. You know, it's, it's, it gets kind of more complicated, but really it, it's about, you know, how that person invested and where their, uh, their tax percentile is. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they can totally write that off, and that's really another 35%. Mm -hmm. They can totally write off and get back. Mm -hmm. So now their risk is now lowered right. to, you know, you have 35 for here, 35 for here, mm -hmm. that's 70%, so now it's 30%. Mm -hmm. So now you're only at risk for $30,000 out of that 100. Ah. Okay. So now you're like, oh my God, so now there's, there's that. Right, and that right. makes life a lot mm -hmm. easier when you know that, and mm -hmm. most people don't even know that, don't mm -hmm. even apply. We do the, they do these you know, New York films, don't even apply for mm -hmm. the, the New York tax incentive. Mm -hmm. I don't even know about the federal incentives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that right there you know, mm -hmm. usually puts an investor mm -hmm. at ease. Okay, okay. You know? um, mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing that there, there are kind of two sides to the filmmaking, and most people know of the Hollywood thing, and you know, the, on Monday, you look and you say, oh my God, you know, Gravity made $55 million for the weekend, right, right, and right, Captain right. Phillips made $40 million for the weekend, or 26 right, or whatever right, it was, right, right. and that's the extent of 
box office money making movie making that most people know. And there's that other side of it where you are scrolling through Netflix and you see about a thousand movies you've never heard of. Right, and right, like, right, right. What movie is this? You're like, oh right. my God. And right. you look through it and you see that person has made about three or four movies and you've right. never heard of any of them. Never heard of any. And you're like, how does that happen? Right. It happens because these movies are profitable but no one talks about it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I know that when I do a movie mm -hmm. and I go, okay, I can make this for $500,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I know for the most part when mm -hmm. all is said and done, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll probably make about, you know, let's, let's just say, the investor makes, now for, for most investors mm -hmm. out there, mm -hmm. a 20% return is amazing. Right. If you invest in something, you got 20, that's, that's why I got people involved, in, unfortunately, with the Bernie Madoff thing, is that, you know, <laughs> he made these promises of these 20% returns, right. which were right. amazing. Right. And that's why everyone right. gave their money, because 20% is right. huge. You're, like, you're right. telling me if I, if I invest 100,000 with you, I can get another 20 grand, that's insane. But with film, even on that smaller level, yeah. average, if it's done right, you know, people do make 50, 60, 70%, 100% on their return. Now, we're not talking about $20 million. Right. right you know? Right, right. But if a movie was made for 500000 and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. all said and done, you know, the movie makes $2 million between, you know, VOD and any, you know, deals, because internationally, you know, which is great because the, the uh, theater market internationally has grown so much. So maybe a movie won't do mm -hmm. anything in the United States. And you could make, you know, three hundred thousand dollars, you know, overseas. Right. You know, which could be great. Right. right. And the movie clears two million. You're like, oh my god, I just mm -hmm. made this investor mm -hmm. like, you know, a four hundred percent return on his wow. money. You know, which wow. which could be huge. And that's what keeps these movies going. Mm -hmm. And maybe it is kind of a dirty little secret, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, what ends up <laughs> happening is mm -hmm. these investors they see that and they go, well, okay, I just made four hundred with this little small movie. I just made this great return. Um, then they start investing in larger movies and then the risk becomes much, much greater. And the next thing you know is that mm -hmm. your investor mm -hmm. who did, you know, a killing mm -hmm. right. investing five hundred thousand dollars is now right. investing, you know, seven million dollars. Right. And, you know, and the risk becomes mm -hmm. huge and, and kind of the mm -hmm. the um, the mm -hmm. formula starts mm -hmm. to break our break apart a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. that's that's kind of how mm -hmm. it's done and uh, what is a typical uh, budget for the movie? for you, you know, in, small budget. In like New York that. City, I, I find you'll mm -hmm. typically, for the most part, mm -hmm. um, at any given time, uh, the budgets in New York City is gonna be 500 grand. 500 grand mm -hmm. is is mm -hmm. a price point where you can get mm -hmm. some really good actors. Okay. You can get a really professional crew. Okay. And you can shoot at a decent amount of time to get your movie done. Mm -hmm. So, if I, and, and also edit movies. So, so 500,000 is probably the most um, common common budget budget when so you're talking indie film. So let's say let's say you know like uh, you have now scripts right. You got mm -hmm. the budget. You got the investors lined up, and the next thing is you pick the actors and you know think people who are suitable for the different roles. Yeah, you you like get with a, uh, get with a really good casting director that you you look again you look at the their casting credits. director. Yeah, so you, you have you a, casting a casting director. director. Will be you need another. Yeah, one. you need honestly once you get you know you have the investors lined up you have to hire people that know more than you. There has to be, every other department has to be right. super experienced more than you. And casting is truly, I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just say casting directors probably get mm -hmm. the least respect out of anyone in this entire business and they're arguably the most important. Mm -hmm. I have such a respect mm -hmm. for casting directors right. and it's a shame right. that there's not even uh, an Oscar category for casting directing, uh, for, for casting, which is really insane. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, th the fact that, you know, you have a makeup category, a production mm -hmm. design category, mm -hmm. you know, a costume category, mm -hmm. and there's no mm -hmm. casting category is crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, because mm -hmm. these movies live and die on their casting. Right. You right. know, for right. my movie, Police State, right. my casting director, Pat McCorkle, you know, who's mm -hmm. done huge movies, and as a matter of fact, just coincidentally, mm -hmm. um, one mm -hmm. of the movies that Police State was patterned after was mm -hmm. Die Hard with a Vengeance, because it was a movie in which, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Willis and, and um, Sam Jackson went all these different plates in New York City, and that's kind of what we do with Police State, so right. it's kind of a coincidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. she had casted that, mm -hmm. and she got me these leads that were just ex spot on exactly what the film needed, exactly what I wanted, wow. and people I could have never gotten on my own, I, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't know, mm -hmm. and just, mm -hmm. it was just like a godsend, like, oh, this is mm -hmm. perfect, mm -hmm. perfect, mm -hmm. perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, even my, like my, my star, I mean, I feel like he's the next Tom Cruise. He is this guy that is just 
good looking, but can act, has the charisma that you would not believe. I mean, this guy mm. is is mm. absolutely amazing. Wow. Um, so you need a yeah, you need a casting director who who then you, you mm -hmm. start going to the casting process and find mm -hmm. uh, you know who the best actor is. Right. One of the mistakes that most people make is and and, in, right. and investors and producers, you start getting into well, we need some sort of name, which mm -hmm. is probably one of the most ridiculous things that will happen to your film mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. number one, who is considered a name is completely subjective, and uh, I dealt mm -hmm. with casting directors who think that, you know, Val Kilmer is the biggest star in the universe. Mm -hmm. And another one would be like, Val who? You don't even know who that person is. Mm -hmm. And then when you start talking about like, well, can we get Bruce Willis? I'm like, no, you can't. You can't get <laughs> Bruce Willis. No, mm -hmm. you can't get Tom Cruise. And mm -hmm. you'll hear these names being, you know, bandied about in, you know, in these uh, production meetings. That's ridiculous. And mm -hmm. the moral of the story is you need the best actor. Okay. That's who you need. You don't okay. need a name. That means nothing. And if, if anything, if, if there's any indication that who's in your movie doesn't mean anything, you could just, for a given year, mm -hmm. look at all the movies that come out. Okay. Look at all the movies that come to the theater, for the most part, they're always going to be considered some sort of A-list star. Right. Some of these a lot of these movies flop. A lot of these movies right. just flop. They just mm -hmm. die. Even, you know, Captain Fellowships came out, which, you know, mm -hmm. is, is doing well. But the movie before that was Larry Crown, mm. and that starred Tom Hanks and Julia Roberts, arguably two huge stars, right? Right, right. That did less money than, <laughs> I mean, it completely died. Wow. I mean, I think they had a funeral for that movie. Wow. So it just does not matter. You know, if the if, if movie is good, people will see it. The movie is bad, people will not see it. Mm. You know, the documentary mm. that I have in theaters mm. now is doing amazing. In its first week, it beat out a kind of a big Hollywood movie because people really wanted to see this documentary. Wow. You know, and, and it was something that we were just like, it actually did much better than anyone mm -hmm. could have thought. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. the fact that it is good and it mm -hmm. got great reviews, mm -hmm. you know, that's why mm -hmm. it's the number one documentary in America. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's something that people wanted to see. So mm -hmm. just try to make a good movie. Don't try to get stars. You won't. See, in India, you know, Bollywood is very different. Like, yeah. very different meaning? It's not very different. It is, but because the movie, let's you know, for example, if you have a big actor or a big director makes a movie, then he puts the movie at the at the right time. Mm -hmm. Timing is very important, obviously. At the right time, that's the Diwali time, right? So yep. we have a we have a few movies come on Diwali time, and he puts in a like you know, fifty thousand theaters in there. Wow. I'm just get, I'm yeah. just giving it you know number number right. But you know once he puts in and even if he makes like a, for example before even know people that this is a, not a good movie, he already made his money. Right. That's how it works in India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but here is different, I guess. Here. It's it's you know there's there's a piece of that that's the same where where it's something called pre-selling your movie. Right. A and right. if you are making a, a kind of a genre specific movie right. and if there is happens to be someone in that movie that for whatever reason like there are certain people who do mean something overseas for whatever weird reason right. you can pre-sell these territories and you can make your money back before sometimes mm. even before you right. even shoot a single reel of film exactly. uh, and there you know there's like Steven Seagal right. movies and right. Van Damme movies they're those are for the most part hardly made. That they right. they right. sell they sell very well internationally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're always mm -hmm. always profitable, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what is your dream project? Tell me, uh, tell us about dream project. Uh, about. Dream project. Um, well, number one, I I am a comic book geek. I, I mean, I I really mm -hmm. do love. I was, you know, brought up on comics and I read them all. Um, so doing some sort of comic movie and doing a Batman movie is kind of a dream. It's something that can't, probably won't happen because the, the landscape of what it is now. Right. But right. but right now my biggest dream project is mm -hmm. one of my favorite mm -hmm. shows of all time. Mm -hmm. It's an animated show. It's, mm -hmm. it's called The Last Airbender. Okay. And uh, M. Night Shyamalan actually directed The Last Airbender, and it was terrible. And he kind of ruined <laughs> uh, <laughs> he kind of ruined everything, you know, oh. about that movie. And it was so different from the animation. But now they have a, kind of a sequel called The Legend of Korra, okay. which I love. And that, for right now, is my dream project. I would love to direct The Legend of Korra because it is just a big adventure movie, you know, mm -hmm. that, that would be kind of like Harry Potter in the sense that right. it'd be four movies. Right. The characters are so rich. It's something that I know. There's certain things you know you can do well, right. and that's something I can do well. So The Legend of Korra mm -hmm. for right now is my it, dream project. Have you ever thought about acting? 
I actually, um, I do a little scene in Police State, okay. but I made sure it was a scene that I could easily cut out if it was terrible. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think uh, I'm not an actor and there's not, you know, the, the, the people who can act, I mean, mm -hmm. when you watch them, it's mm -hmm. kind of a, a revelation. Mm -hmm. You're like, I, I don't know how you do that. I can't, I don't understand. Wow. Um, <laughs> you know, for me, if I'm just, I, I'll probably at this point do small little things here and there for fun. Oh. You know, and, mm -hmm. I, and uh, my st I've been asked by certain filmmakers, hey, do you want to do this and that? And I was like, I will only do it if it's a non-pivotal scene or a scene that you could easily cut out. I don't right. want to be uh, the one responsible for ruining a movie because it's like, you know, a movie's going well. And you're like, who the heck was that? <laughs> that guy is awful. You know, I was like, I don't be that guy. So if, you can, if it's a scene where you can easily cut me out, fantastic. I, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, you know. Mm. Uh, and I love action. So, any t you know, I, I could definitely see myself in kind of, you know, larger, uh, big mm. movies, you know, mm. uh, kind of being the guy who's in the mood for half an hour, then mm. unfortunately the alien kills me. You know, that, that, <laughs> that's, that would be fine for me. You know, I'll, okay. I'll lose my head to a 10 foot tall <laughs> alien any day. So what is your advice for a college graduate? Like, you know, college graduate who comes out and wants to get into this industry, you know, like a media and entertainment industry, right? I mean, you know, uh, is there is there a way t for them to specifically, you know, how do they get it? It's a combination, and, and I again, I just can't stress enough how important knowledge is. And I would say mm -hmm. the first mm -hmm. thing is mm -hmm. read a lot of industry books. Okay. okay. Read, uh, you have to, and you have to, why is it, you know, it's funny, like, you know, you'll be considered a lazy bum watching television movies all day, but that are th that is our research papers. You know, if you're a doctor, you're constantly reading these research papers and right. journals, right. and television is it, and movies are it. Right. If you're not knowledgeable about what mm -hmm. is out there, mm -hmm. and who those players are, and you know, then you're not, mm -hmm. then you're nobody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Information is power. So if you just graduate, excuse me, graduated college, then yeah, mm -hmm. you just have to do a lot of reading, a lot of watching, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and then be bold. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you be bold, and you have to prove yourself, and mm -hmm. and you have to be fearless, and don't be afraid. You have to understand that the word no and failing is the largest part of this business. There mm -hmm. is not a per. I know it seems like sometimes because mm -hmm. you don't you don't hear of a person until they have their right. success, but right. you don't know about the right. d a decade mm -hmm. of horrible failure, of horrible horrible mm -hmm. failure mm -hmm. the person had. But those failures, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but it is mm -hmm. absolutely true that you learn more from failure than you do from success. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, that so, that so don't be afraid. You can't be afraid of it if you know it's going to happen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. And I know that, like, one of the first big movies that I uh, produced called Last Day of Summer, the same company that I did the documentary with and police set with, when that movie came out, mm -hmm. I mean, it just dropped dead. I mean, mm -hmm. it did nothing in the box office. Mm -hmm. It got... Mm -hmm skewered with the critics. I mean, it was just, and we happened to have like a, the girl from Twilight, so it had like a, you know, it had like a lot of press, and it just, mm -hmm. I mean, it was terrible, and it was a really big disappointment. Mm -hmm. But you know, you learn so much from that. Mm -hmm. You right. learn so much from that, right, you know? Right, right. Um, yeah. So, that, that is it, and, and, and just realize that whatever you're gonna do, it's gonna take a lot of time, mm -hmm. and don't, don't look for those shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And don't mm -hmm. try to be that maverick who's like, well, I'm going to do it this mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't, don't look. Mm -hmm. You know, people try mm -hmm. to live their life with the exceptions and not the rules. Right. And those, uh, those exceptions, I mean, they're, you know, they're anomalies. They're non-recurring phenomenons. Um, you really just have to work hard. Right. You have to work hard and understand that, you know, if you're just graduating college and you're 21 or 22, right. you're so young and you have a lot of time. And I know that it can be right. discouraged. I'm 36 years old. Right. Okay. Well, we guessed um, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and. From Raiders of the Lost Ark, five year old. So exactly. <laughs> you know, at that point, it's just simple math. <laughs> um, but really, you know, some days I feel old and I'm like, God, because. You know, it, it got to a point where it used to be, I used to be the youngest person on set. I used right. to be always be the youngest person. I felt like some kind of wonderkind. Right. And now it got to a point where on this last movie, Police State, I was the oldest person on set. Wow. And talking to my AD, who was 23 years old, wow. only knew Demi Moore mm -hmm. as Aston mm -hmm. Kutcher's wife and not Demi Moore, the actors or the career that she's mm -hmm. had. And it just kind of blew my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But some days they feel old, some days they feel really young. And when, when, in, mm -hmm. when you look at it um, objectively, you know, 36 mm -hmm. is very young. You know, wow. there's, yeah, I know. there's yeah. people who you've, you know, 
look at Morgan Freeman, his first like movie movie, he was 51. He was 51 wow. years old. Wow. You know, and like, you know, there's a lot of people who are kind of late in life in their 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. once you kind of are in this for a while and you're doing it for a while, at that point, you just go, okay, mm -hmm. I know it's coming. I have to be patient. Mm -hmm. A lot of the uh, people that I used to work with, a right. lot of them are doing extremely well. I'm talking about actors who, you know, would maybe get like a s tiny speaking role on Law right. & Order right, right, right. twice a year or something, right, right. who are now starring in things, who have their own sitcom. I mean, it's amazing when I see that. I go, oh my God, I used to represent you when you were just mm -hmm. a 20-year-old kid and, you know. You just have to hang in there. And mm -hmm. things never work out the way you think they do. Mm -hmm. I can tell you mm -hmm. that from the, one of the biggest things is that, mm -hmm. you know, I directed mm -hmm. a, uh, a viral video okay. called uh, I Got a Crush on Obama. Oh, and it was okay. this thing with this girl singing about having a crush. This is 2007, before mm -hmm. anyone knew who Obama was. This, mm -hmm. That was kind of the joke, was uh, that this guy was, you know, I, some black guy, in the, you know, running for, this, this is the Democratic primaries, but he wasn't even a candidate, no one knew. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And it got hugely successful, and I mean, it got a gazillion of views, and I mean, I ended up doing talk shows everywhere. Wow. Um, wow. I was invited to Republican, Democratic debates. Uh, I mean, people on news shows were singing it. I mean, it was, it, it exploded in a way that I never could have imagined. And I thought at that point in 2007, hmm that I had arrived and at that point it was just going to be this meteoric rise of mm. you know the guy who did this thing and I'll be doing that and I'll be doing this right. and, da, 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 da. and that did not happen mm. and it didn't happen for a lot of different reasons but right. you know the fact that it didn't work out the way and I remember this is 2007 so now this mm. is six years later mm -hmm. um, and now mm -hmm. the things are you know going differently but still well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's okay it's mm -hmm. okay you know um, right. You, you have to roll with it, you know, don't get stuck on, but it's, don't get stuck on it's supposed to be. Right, right, right. You know, right, you know right. that this business, it, in a lot of ways, is like the Wild West. Mm -hmm. There, it is not, you know, some very formatted, well, once you do this, this will happen, and this will happen. It's, it's not. Not at all, no. and for the most part, right. because we don't have a product, right. meaning when you are talking to someone, before you have a film, mm. mostly everything in this business mm. is personality driven. Right. It's the idea of selling someone on an idea and mm. not on, you know, a, a can of Coke. Um, and because it's so like that, you, I mean, it just, you just don't know from day to day. The result, you have to wait for six months, who knows? Yeah. Maybe more. Absolutely. Right, that's the key. I that mean, in our business, same thing, you know, when we do IT, right? Yeah. You know, before even results came in, I mean, it may be six month year. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Pharmaceuticals. Service. Same thing, you know, yeah. it, it's... I know people who've you know, worked, you know, in pharmaceutical companies who've been working on this one right. particular, you know, drug mm -hmm. for six, seven years, and it's right. like, oh my God, and finally right. it hits, and you know, and that's the it. stock <laughs> surge, and you become a millionaire overnight, but <laughs> you know. But you have to wait for that. Yeah, but it's, it takes yeah. a while. Do you use interns, college interns, or things like that? Do you use in your, I mean, well, okay, uh, you have your own uh, firm, company. Yeah, right? I work with everyone, yeah. Right, so do you use interns in that at all, or? Very rarely. Very rarely. Okay. Very rarely. And mm -hmm. I, I know that most people love using interns. Right. Because yeah. they feel that it's, you know, free. Just basically, right. they use as free help. Right. Um, I don't like that mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons. Mm -hmm. I, I think, mm -hmm. number one, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. someone who is a paid assistant, right. doing what, what is considered the menial work that will give to assistants is right. part of the building of that assistant. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I know it, it seems like making a phone call here and there is... It's mm -hmm. a menial task, but those phone calls, you get to know certain people. Mm -hmm. Listen, a lot of assistance for other people become huge whatever, so right. I think that's part of it. Right. Um, and also, interns don't represent your business well because right. they don't know the business because you're just mm -hmm. using them to do mm -hmm. random stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're not learning mm -hmm. anything, and, and I, I don't mm -hmm. like taking advantage of people um, mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. um, there are some people that use them properly, and they get the college credit, and they do learn mm -hmm. stuff, but mm -hmm. I would say 90% of the time, they're just you know taken advantage of. So I, I, mm -hmm. I try not to use interns. What about the Bollywood movies? I mean, have you ever had a connection with Bolly mo Bollywood movie at all? I did. I worked on a movie called Desperate Endeavors, and okay. uh, it starred Gulshan Grover and uh, Samrat, I'm blanking on his name, but I, know, I think mm -hmm. he's kind of big, and Ishmael Bashi and some other, mm -hmm. you know, bigger Indian mm -hmm. names. Mm -hmm. And that was a completely new experience uh, to me, but also mm -hmm. kind of an eye-opening experience. Um, mm -hmm. If you haven't noticed, I am black. Mm 
Right. And uh, <laughs> I know you might not have noticed this. Um, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a reminder of the problems that mm -hmm. I think specifically uh, black people and women have that Indian people and Jewish people mm -hmm. uh, do not have. Where we were making this Indian movie, there was such, a Bollywood movie, excuse me, uh, mm -hmm. there was such a sense of community in the sense that we mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. shot in c uh, certain towns that were, mm -hmm. it was a lot of uh, uh, Indian communities that came together to help in so many different ways mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. where you don't see that, you know, a lot, you mm -hmm. know, and it was, uh, and that to me was eye-opening at how it's kind of that, that one team, one dream sort of thing. Right. And how you want to lift everyone up. Right. You know, whereas mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. black people and I think women in particular mm -hmm. uh, have this misconception that there is a finite number of people that can be employed at any given time. Mm -hmm. So instead of coming all together, we try to tear each other down and kind of keep the other person lower. Mm -hmm. um, and just mm -hmm. Historically, that's just kind of the way it's been. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But but also you know um, that movie in particular was also eye opening because uh, the way it was done um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was kind of the it was a, it's a melodrama and I had never worked on a melodrama before and I mm -hmm. think that most Bollywood movies are melodramas um, and if you know if I have to define what a you know melodrama is it's usually where the audience knows everything and they're just watching the characters discover it where it's usually you know the characters and the audience discover things at the same time and mm -hmm. I think so Bollywood movies are melodramas so I wasn't I was not prepared for that um, uh, for that genre mm -hmm. change and I was like oh my god this feels like everything is so on the nose like you know <laughs> of course this person's bad and because if that person was bad they were really a bad person <laughs> and this person was good they you know basically had a halo on their head you know it was just <laughs> like it was you know and I thought it was very simple storytelling but I realized you know I realized later on that you know mm -hmm. these were you know you know parables in a sense like stories representing other things mm -hmm. like teaching tools with entertainment right. and uh, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, we, we normally have six seven songs in the movie. Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, always one hero always falls in love with heroine something like that. You know, that's typical. And there is a villain, you know, who does other wrong things and you know they fight and at the end hero wins. Yes, you know, and, and, and in a sense, they could say, like, wow, it's all the same story, but uh, Hollywood is kind of the same thing. <laughs> every, every big uh, movie you see this summer, there's a hero, and yeah. then there's a heroine, and instead of songs, it's a fight scene, and then, uh, but they yeah. all fall in love at the end. It's the same thing. The same thing, right? The same thing <laughs> without the Saudis, you know? Well, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming. Thank you. This is fun. The very good knowledge for our viewers. And uh, I mean, I'm, I do hope to see you f in future also when the police state comes. Absolutely. Right. Thank you for joining us today. If you have any questions, comments, you can email me at rajmitv at gmail.com. Again, that's rajmitv at gmail.com. If you would like to watch our prior shows, you can go to youtube.com slash Infosys International. Again, that's youtube.com slash Infosys International. Until next time, have a great week.